Welcome to SSI Meetup. Today we will have with us Daniel Hardman. He is a frequent guest to SSI Meetup and he's the Chief Architect of Evanim and also Secretary of the Technical Governance Board of the Sovereign Foundation. And all of you who joined us already in the past, you will know him really well. And Daniel is one of those guys that I look up to to learn about the latest stuff happening from a technical but also philosophical and fundamental point of view in the SSI space. And yeah, so check out the previous SSI meetups we had before, please. And today, the subject will be really, really fascinating. It's one of the things that I think will be moving and shaking the SSI space, which is um, peer DIDs, which is much more than only those words, because it means that we might have ledgerless um, SSI in the future, that we might have ledger agnostic ways to implement this with peer DIDs. And all this is something that Daniel will be sharing with us today, and that I hope that all of you will be sharing too, and hopefully also joining um, Daniel and the whole community in, in, in developing. Um, we just gonna go quickly through the next slide, the second slide where we summarize um, what we try to do and achieve at SSI Meetup. Basically, we're trying to empower global SSI communities uh, and it's open to everyone. If you're like a company, an individual, an association, a social movement and interested in SSI, you can reuse all this material to share it around the world. And this is being done already very actively. We do like SSI meetups and popping up in different places. Like the latest one we had is in, in Korea where they created SSI Meetup Korea to share the material and, and push the SSI communities. Um, and also people using this material all over the world. And all this is possible because you're sharing it with the Creative Commons by share like license, which basically means is that you can be using whatever way you want. You just need to give credit back today, for example, to Daniel and also to SSI Meetup. And, um, and then you can use the material. We publish all this with the Google Slide Deck that allows you to download the slides, adapt them, translate them, or whatever you want. You can also watch the videos, and we also share a slide share deck. And um, yeah, so this is all the material. Uh, check out the previous 41 chapters we had. This is chapter 42, and we hope to do many, many more in the future. And um, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can use the question tool. And, and and I will bring up those questions to Daniel during the presentation if, the, if it's the right time. If not, we, we cover those questions at the end. Um, Daniel also mentioned that this is a highly technical subject. So we will try, um, depending on how the questions add up, to cover the more basic ones at the beginning and the more technical ones at the end. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, who joined us today. And Daniel, thank you so much again for joining us at SSI Meetup. And uh, we all look, really look forward to learn about what you have to share with us today. Thank you. Can somebody just confirm that you can hear my voice well? Yeah, can hear it okay. great. Good. So what I'm going to talk about today is a way of managing DIDs that uh, is very different from the way that most uh, of us have been thinking about them. Now, this way of managing DIDs is not meant to uh, eliminate the other way, but rather to complement the other way of managing DIDs. And there are reasons why you would need DIDs that are registered on blockchains. Um, if you are going to use those DIDs as the basis of reputation for issuing credentials, for example, as an issuer, you probably do need to have a public DID that's registered on the ledger. But what I'm going to suggest is that for ordinary relationships, um, this new kind of did might be um, very helpful to you. And when I call it a new kind of did, it is the same did, it matches the same format, it meets the same um, specification requirements as any other kind of did. Um, so it's only new in the sense that it's a did method that you may not have heard of before. Now, let me just spend 30 seconds explaining DIDs for anybody who doesn't even know um, about the DID thing with high confidence. Um, a DID is a decentralized identifier, and you can think of it like a, um, a UUID that has special qualities. Uh, some of the special qualities are you can look it up and find out uh, what keys are being used to control it. And then you can use that information as the basis of kind of a reliable handle to another party in a decentralized identity ecosystem. So um, the normal way that we implement DIDs looks like this diagram. Um, we um, have two parties that want to relate, and I've drawn uh, the two parties as uh, 
a building and a person uh, representing an organization or institution and a private individual. But really, the two parties could be IoT devices or, or whatever. But these two parties that want to interact with each other need to get a handle for each other, and that's the DID. And um, the, the way that we would typically get that handle is that Bob would create a DID for the relationship that he has with ACME. And um, you see right here, um, uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but anyway, I'm pointing to Bob. Um, there's a b.did at b colon a. That would be his pairwise did for the Bob to ACME relationship. And there's an arrow from that going up, going down to a uh, blockchain in the bottom, and uh, the words register and update on that arrow. Um, so the way that Bob would create this did is he would interact with the blockchain and say, here's the information to create my did, please make it so. The blockchain would go ahead and do that. And then later, Acme could go to that blockchain and you'll see an arrow coming out the other side that says resolve b.did at b.a, b colon a. Um, Acme could go look up that did on the blockchain and um, know with confidence that it really is controlled by Bob because any interactions they have with Bob would um, be signed or encrypted using keys that Bob declared are associated with that did. That's kind of the short summary of how ordinary did methods work. The blockchain becomes a source of truth um, for those dids. Now, there's some other dids on this diagram. Uh, the did that I started talking about is a, in red. Um, it's a pairwise did, and the red kind of goes along with the, the, the sentiment that you shouldn't share it. It's private. Um, there's also a public did. If you look at Acme, um, a dot did at any. This is a did that Acme would use and announce to the world. They could publish it on their website or uh, and the well-known location that um, the diff folks have worked on and tell the world, this is a did that you can know with confidence represents Acme. And they would also, besides publishing it in those mechanisms, they would have to go register it on a blockchain. And then when the world wanted to know if, that's, if they're really interacting with Acme, um, they could check to see if a digital signature or uh, some encryption that they're uh, seeing is really associated with keys that Acme registered in the uh, record for that did on the blockchain. Um, now, what's interesting is I've drawn Bob and this institution, but there's an arrow kind of going down to the bottom right. And this is meant to represent the fact that other parties in the world can do the same, can look up the same information. So um, anybody can go to the blockchain and look up a particular did and ask questions about what it means. Now, um, there's green dids and red dids that I've drawn up here and pulling information about green dids like a dot did at any um, out of a public blockchain makes a lot of sense. All of the world, everybody in the world needs to know whether Acme does business with that did. Um, and the at any part is meant to represent the fact that it should be relevant to any context. But the red dids that are have a private context to them, B dot did at B colon A, are intended to show that the, the relevance of that did is only within a pairwise context. So really, only Bob and Acme should care about Bob's did for the Bob-Acme relationship. Yet, the blockchain is going to a lot of trouble to register that did, and it's going to allow anybody in the world to resolve it. And one of the big um, insights that prompted the development of the peer did thing that I'm here to talk about is that we don't actually need that. We don't need the blockchain to um, mediate a private relationship. We only need it to mediate public relationships. So, um, whoops, went a little bit too far here. Now let me contrast this diagram with what peer dids do. And um, I think at a high level, this will kind of uh, capture the idea in a way that will frame the rest of the discussion. We still have the Bob and the Acme relationship, but um, now 
we've eliminated the blockchain. There's no blockchain in the down in the, in the middle of the diagram at the bottom, and we've also eliminated the other parties uh, in the bottom right corner. If I flip back and forth, you kind of see the two parts that were subtracted. So what happens instead of registering something on a blockchain, Bob still creates his pairwise did, but now in, what he does is he says to himself, okay, I don't need a global source of truth for this, but I do need to make sure that the partner that I have in this pairwise relationship, which in this case is Acme, I need to make sure that they know what my did is. So there's an arrow now that flows uh, from Bob, uh, says register update, and it flows uh, into his did document, um, doc at A colon B, which is being transmitted to Acme. So Bob essentially communicates directly to Acme the information that Acme needs to know about his did. And likewise, Acme in its pairwise did for the relationship, the private relationship it has with Bob, it generates a did, puts it in the did doc and sends it to Bob and Bob finds out about it. And as long as Acme and Bob agree on what the contents of their respective did docs are, um, the rest of the world doesn't need to know or care and the blockchain doesn't need to be involved. So that at a high level is how peer dids differ from other ones. Now, I have a whole bunch of content behind this and a lot of things to, that I wanna explore in greater detail, but let me stop here for just a minute and check, does everybody feel comfortable with this level of detail in the explanation or would you like to ask some questions uh, at this level before I continue? Maybe let's give everyone like 20 seconds maybe to check. If anyone has any questions now for Daniel, maybe you can share them in the question tool. And if not, um, um, we can just continue with the next slides. All right, there's one coming up here. Uh, okay, this is Doc, he's saying, um, could the blockchain be represented with IPFS as well for, for a public resolver? Yes, absolutely, the answer is yes. This thing that, this icon that I uh, created for a blockchain here, what it really represents is some kind of global source of truth. A blockchain is the, simplest and most obvious um, example, but a distributed hash table like IPFS would work. Um, and there's probably some other things that would work equally well also. So um, all did methods before peer did, and now there've been a couple of other ones that have kind of come up since, but, but all of the early did methods assumed there was this global source of truth and um, IPFS would absolutely play that role. Um, so the did IPFS thing is an example that's very aligned with most other did methods. Yeah, and we have Emery also asking, um, how does Bob validate that he's communicating with the actual ACME? Okay, so um, the answer to that is that there's, there's several different mechanisms and Bob can use a combination of them that uh, meets his purposes. Um, Acme could already have some kind of an account that Bob logs into and therefore they could have some method of securely communicating. If that's true, uh, Acme could simply use, uh, you know, like Bob's uh, session on their website that is already authenticated and say, by the way, here's this did that I want to use. Um, there's also ways that um, Acme could present a verifiable credential to um, prove who it is. Um, this is a larger question, and I don't want to get into it in great detail right now, but um, suffice it to say, it's a good question, and there's multiple methods. Okay. Um, and then Michael is asking, um, where do the private DID docs live, if not on the public blockchain? The answer is that they live in the storage controlled by Bob and Acme, and that storage could be on a hard drive of a laptop or a mobile device. It could be on a server in Acme's data center. We don't have a strong opinion about where it lives, so long as the place that it lives is under the control of the respective parties and only and directly under their control. So 
Bob should not put his did doc for this relationship out on a publicly shared um, uh, Dropbox uh, folder. That would be a bad place for it. But he could certainly put it on uh, his, uh, you know, private hard drive, um, and he could put on multiple places. Put it on the thumb drive, whatever. And same for Acme. The point is not it's it's not this diagram is true regardless of where the storage is. Excellent. I think those are the questions we had for the time being. Okay, so let me go ahead and continue then. Um, thank you for those questions. Those are great. So why would we actually be doing this? Why do we care? So there's a list of benefits here, and I'm not going to read through them uh, kind of word for word, but you get the idea. Um, if there's got to be a global source of truth, and if there's billions of DIDs, then that global source of truth has to be capable of storing billions of DIDs and updating billions of DIDs. And um, that is a scale and performance problem. Now, there are clever ways to address that, and the side tree protocol that has been developed at DIFF is an example of a clever way to alleviate some of that pressure. But um, Peer Dids actually takes this one step further and says, we don't have to write a whole bunch of stuff to a ledger. Even the root of a Merkle tree doesn't have to be written to a ledger because the parties that are involved in this pairwise relationship are the only ones that need to store anything. Therefore, um, if you have a million relationships, you probably have a million parties that have storage capacity and network capacity, and they can do whatever they want. And if you only have a thousand, then you only have a thousand. The point is, it it just directly scales um, with the participants without any central system having to worry. There are some security and privacy benefits. Um, there's some regulatory. Um, uh, benefits. Right now there are debates happening in circles related to uh, European Union law and GDPR. Is a did a piece of PII? And so far the prevailing legal opinion seems to be yes, which it creates some um, wrinkles uh, when you store uh, private dids on a public ledger and then you have things like right to be forgotten and so forth. So there's a bunch of reasons, and um, all of them, I think, are good. You may find some of them more compelling than others, but suffice it to say, this isn't a crazy uh, idea, and there are some benefits we expect to get out of going down this road. So how do you actually create a peer did? If we were talking about an ordinary method that was based on IPFS or blockchain or something like that, the way you would create it is you'd make a request to that central system. You'd give it the metadata that it asked for, kind of the parameters to creating, and it would give you back a confirmation that the did had been created. Well, the peer did, you're not interacting with some other system. You are doing this yourself. So the way that you do this is, is basically a three-step process. You make a did doc, and you put whatever keys you want in it, but you don't put the actual did value in it yet. That did doc that you create is called the stored variant of the document. Then you take that document and you compute the SHA-256 hash of it and you get a number, a 256-bit number. That number is called the numeric basis for your peer did. Then you take that numeric basis and you run it through some encoding rules and what you end up with is a new string, and then you put the prefix did colon peer on the front of it and, and attach your new string, and that becomes your actual peer did. So let me uh, show you how that actually works in practice. So this is a diagram, and at the top of the diagram, uh, these are the logical pieces of a peer did, and at the bottom is an actual peer did value. And the diagram's kind of trying to show how the actual peer did value maps onto pieces of information. So there's a method prefix, which is just did colon peer colon. Then there's a numeric algorithm. This is the, what method are you using to come up with a numeric basis? And I just told you the method is, we did a SHA-256 hash of the document. That's method one. If somebody says, well, in the future, I want to use a SHA-512 um, hash instead, that would become method two. 
And so a numeric algorithm too. And, and we could add other algorithms as needed. Right now, I think we only need one algorithm, but if the SHA-256 algorithm is proven to be insecure or something, we could change it. Then um, you specify how the numeric basis is going to be, uh, how, how the binary information uh, in the numeric basis is going to be transformed. And in this case, we're going to specify that we're using base 58. That's the current standard for um, peer dits. So that um, number Z um, is, there's a reason why it's Z. I don't want to go into the details, but anyway, that tells us that we're using base 58. Then what follows is a base 58 clump of data. And that base 58 clump of data has a prefix that is a multi-codec. It's saying, what is this thing that we're showing to you as base 58? In this case, we're saying it's a SHA-2-256 value that's 32 bytes long. And then we take the numeric output from the algorithm and we uh, put that prefix on, run it through the base 58 thing. We get an encoded numeric basis and we stick that on the end. Um, these details don't need to be, um, you, know, you don't need to remember all these details. The main thing, if you step back and squint, is just the way to create a peer did is make whatever did document you want, take the contents of the document and run it through an algorithm and that gives you the peer did. Okay, so um, this is an example of a peer did did document. Um, it's a very simple example, but it's I, I'm hoping that you get the impression by looking at it, oh, this is relatively simple. So let's go through the pieces of it. Um, the did spec says that you can define keys in a did document. And so this did document has a section called public. I think actually there's a mistake here. It should be called public key without an S, not public key with an S now that I look at it. Um, but anyway, public key is an array of, of key definitions. And here we're defining a key in JWK format. And so we've defined one key. And we've given that key the identifier KID1, okay? So in this did document, we only have one key. That means there's only one key that can be used to control the did. Um, by the way, I'm using the word control kind of loosely here, not in the formal sense of being a controller in the did method. Um, it, don't get hung up on that if you know about that. Okay, then the second part of the document is an expression of the rules that govern how this did can be used, or how this key can be used with respect to the did. Okay, and that section is named authorization, and it has two subsections. The first subsection is called profiles. Profiles is where you take uh, the keys that uh, exist that you were defining earlier, and you give them a profile. A profile is uh, basically a um, a set of privileges. Uh, the names for profiles are made up arbitrary strings. But I'm saying here that there's one profile defined in this did document, and it applies to key number one. And I'm going to give key number one the role of Solo. Solo is a made up string that I just, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, but now the next part, the rules part says, okay, I should grant the following privileges under the following conditions. And the conditions are when the roles that a key holds include solo, then the privileges that the key um, gets include the privilege to register, the privilege to authcrypt, the privilege to do service endpoint administration, the privilege to see plain text, and the privilege to create obligations. And I'll talk about what these privileges mean in just a minute. But the basic thing that you should get out of this is it's relatively easy. You define a key and you give the key privileges in two parts. You give the first you give the key a profile and then you give the profile privileges. There's a reason why there's that indirection that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and this would be a perfectly valid did doc if it were not for the fact that I got the S wrong in public key and I also 
um, did not put in a JSON LD context. And um, that's just an extra line that we could put in if we needed it. But anyway, um, that should look relatively familiar if you're familiar with did docs at all. So then the next question is, now that I've created a peer did, how do I share it? And the answer, um, there's two answers. Um, the preferred answer is that you use um, a didcom protocol. And there is one formally defined. It's uh, defined in ARIES RFC 23. Uh, probably the definition um, will eventually move somewhere else, but for now that's a good place for it. Um, and the characteristics here are, it, it says, here's how Alice gives Bob her did and gets a did back from Bob in a carefully constructed dance so that information doesn't leak at the wrong stage. Eaves, eavesdroppers cannot interfere. Um, the uh, information can be shared over QR code, all of those kinds of things. So that's what that protocol defines. An alternate alternative is that you could use something other than didcom and the peer did spec actually describes how to do peer dids without didcom if people want to do that so if you wanted to do that what you would do is you would have to transmit the did plus a signed did doc over a tls session or something like it um, there's some reasons why this is suboptimal it does work um, and it's very easy if you already are doing, you know, you already have a TLS session between Alice and Bob, sending this information is um, probably relatively easy. Um, the problem is that um, it's not very standardized because um, what there's some HTTP headers that might be involved and everybody's going to do those a little differently. Um, does Alice go first or does, or does Bob go first? What happens if Alice and Bob trade information in the wrong order or somebody forgets a nonce, that kind of stuff. Um, and it only works over HTTP. So that means that Alice and Bob can't be at a conference without internet and just share the information over Bluetooth, et cetera. So it works, but it, it's got some caveats to it. And that's why I consider this method suboptimal. Um, but it's not rocket science. Neither one of these is rocket science. Now, the next thing I want to um, highlight is that you don't have to implement a very big, complex, fancy uh, body of logic to create peer dids. You saw the recipe for generating one. Um, it's just a three-step process, and it doesn't involve very much in the way of crypto or esoteric stuff. Um, there's actually the, the spec... Uh, gives you three levels or layers of support that you can target. The first layer is just being able to recognize dids, look at a string and say, is this a peer did? Can I validate that it's a real one? And there's a little bit of validation logic that you could apply that can tell the difference between something that just starts with did colon peer and something that's a real peer did. So um, you could implement support for that in your code base uh, in 10 minutes. You just need regular expression support and the spec gives you the regular expression. Uh, and you might want that if you just are creating, let's say, a database that needs to use DIDs uh, as a key to look up something else or it needs to track uh, DIDs uh, that are part of relationships uh, for with your customers or something like that. Um, that's relatively trivial to implement. Layer two is what we call static DIDs. And this is where Alice and Bob can generate DIDs, share them with one another, but they can't update the DIDs in any way. So if you're trying to, uh, if you're trying to just have a short-lived conversation, your relationship's not going to be permanent. This might be a very appropriate level to target, and that's a very low bar to implement. Um, uh, I said that the coding time to implement here on the right, I estimated that at two to six hours. I actually did an implementation of uh, peer dids in Python in about 60 minutes from scratch um, on a flight out to IIW uh, in October. So it's not a very hard thing to start from nothing and get 
uh, support for static peer dids into a code base. Uh, dynamic peer dids is where it gets complicated. If Alice not just wants, she, she doesn't just want to give Bob um, a did document, but she wants to be able to tell Bob, hey, I've rotated my key. Hey, um, I want to delete that uh, key that used to be um, uh, empowered in my environment because I no longer trust it. Um, I want to give new privileges to something that didn't have them before. If that's the kind of thing that needs to be done, then you're talking about layer three. That's the dynamic support layer. And if you already support DIDCOM, then it will probably take you a week of extra work in a code base to implement this, unless you start from a library. And there is a um, right now, there's a reference implementation of peer dids in Python that you could start from. So far, that's the only language that I know of that has a completely, um, you know, independent thing. There's also a somewhat less independent but but somewhat separately consumable implementation of peer dids in Go. And um, there's some work that's happening on peer dids in Rust that you might be able to start from uh, very quickly. I suspect. Um, very quickly, there will also be an implementation in JavaScript because I know some people that are starting to work on that. Um, here's the general status of peer dids as a topic. Uh, the spec uh, has existed now for quite a long time and it's probably major revision six or seven. Um, it's, it's not actually tracking versions very carefully because until now nobody's implemented but just in the last little while we've had implementation start to show up so we're going to be versioning it carefully um, there are some open issues on the github um, repo for the spec and there's at least one important way that it's probably going to change and that is in how keys are formatted in its did documents and this is tied to a conversation that's happening in the uh, peer did or excuse me in the general did spec community where people are talking about whether we should use json ld formatted keys or jwk formatted keys or something uh, that's neither of those so when the people who are writing the did spec start to get aligned we will probably have to update the peer did spec to accommodate whatever decision they make that's probably the the pending important tweak. Um, mostly the rest of the information on the spec is pretty stable at this point, and uh, you can see my notes about implementations. So now let me get into some philosophy and theory of dids a little, peer dids a little bit more. What's actually going on when you want to, um, when Alice wants to tell Bob, hey, I've rotated a key. This is an operation of updating the metadata around a did, and you can think of it as a did doc uh, uh, update. The way that that works with peer dids is that you generate a delta, and that's a JSON fragment that expresses your intentions. So let's say that Alice is trying to add a new key. She would create a JSON fragment that describes the, the key she's going to add. There's a particular format of it that I can explain later. And now her job is, how can I tell Bob about this fragment, this change fragment? And the answer is she encodes that change fragment as uh, a base64. Uh, uh, she takes the, the chunk of JSON, encodes it in base64, and puts it in this structure that's called a delta. The change field in the delta is the base64 encoding of the change fragment. And then she needs to prove that the change is authorized. And she does that by saying, um, here is the uh, signature of the people, the one or two or however many parties are authorizing the change. This is actually likely to change. Right now it shows key colon ID of key and sig colon signature value. This will probably just become an array of JWS structures. Um, so this uh, little graphic I have here is slightly outdated. And then she needs to say when uh, she's doing it. So she bundles up that JSON and she transmits it to Bob. 
Bob evaluates the uh, signatures and decides whether or not um, the rules in the current version of the DID document that he's holding would allow those signing parties to authorize the change that's being proposed. And if the answer is yes, then he accepts the change and updates his own copy of the DID document. Um, there's more to this. This is actually quite a deep subject, but I'm going to stay high level for the time being and we'll get into details uh, in subsequent slides. So what I'd like to do now is uh, talk for just a minute. I'm going to show you four diagrams of different um, worlds that might represent uh, connectivity and uh, communication between parties that we'll call Alice and Bob. So in this particular diagram, Alice owns a phone. She also has uh, put two uh, keys on pieces of paper. She's printed them and in the form of QR codes or something, and maybe locked them away in a vault. And she has some kind of cloud presence that is helping her uh, represent her identity and manage things. Uh, and all of that is part of this oval that's around Alice that we'll call Alice's sovereign domain, her world. These are the set of things she controls. So her DID document, if she's going to use um, her, her phone, her cloud thing, and maybe some keys that she put on paper to prove things to Bob, then her DID document needs to describe all four of those and give them privileges. Meanwhile, Bob has a somewhat different world. He has a tablet and a phone, uh, one key on a piece of paper. He also has something in a cloud. And so there's arrows that go between things inside Bob's world and Alice's world, but there's also arrows that cross the sovereign domain boundaries. And those are the dotted uh, lines that, that go from left to right or right to left. And normally the way that the dotted lines work probably is from Alice's cloud to Bob's cloud. This straight, short, dotted line in the middle. But you can imagine Bob uh, being able to reach out with his tablet and talk directly to Alice's cloud, short-circuiting his own cloud. That would be a legal operation. He might, you might say, Bob shouldn't want to do that. We don't, we, we're not allowed to have opinions about what Bob should want to do. All we're allowed to do, if we're outside Bob's world, is say, um, what are we going to allow him to do? And I think it's probably legal for Bob to contact Alice's cloud in several different ways. So that's what these other arrows represent. And it's also possible that Bob and Alice meet at a conference when there's no internet connection and Bob's got his tablet out of his backpack and he's talking to Alice and Alice has her phone and Bob's phone or Bob's tablet, Alice's phone want to talk directly to each other over Bluetooth. That would be a, um, the orange dotted line here representing a different kind of connectivity. Now, why am I showing this diagram? Because peer did knowledge has to flow. And how that knowledge flows when connectivity is this complicated is a very deep subject. Now, I'm going to try to demystify it a little bit, but I want you to get the impression that, you know, there's a hard problem to solve here. So there's some other possible postures between Alice and Bob. Let's go through some other ones. What about this one? In this case, Alice and Bob have kind of decided, you know what, let's simplify. We don't like all those arrows going everywhere. So Alice says, look, whenever I communicate about updates, all of my update knowledge is going to flow to my cloud, and then from my cloud back to wherever it needs to go in my own domain. And it's also going to flow from my cloud over to Bob's domain. Now, that is a very logical thing for Alice to do. And I think it's uh, probably the way I would choose to implement things if I were building Alice's domain and if I had the option to do so. But there are some times when um, that may not be possible for a particular Alice. So although this is a possible implementation and we should totally support this and I hope a lot of people are able to build it this way. We can't require, Alice cannot require that Bob behave this way and Bob cannot require that Alice behave this way. That's um, being too opinionated about 
the other party in the relationship. It also does not handle the case. If we had this configuration and Alice and Bob met at a conference uh, and they didn't have internet connections, they could not exchange something over Bluetooth according to this topology because they would have to have access to their clouds and their clouds would have to be able to talk. So there's certain things that can't be done in this topology. But that's not a, I'm not dissing it, it's a perfectly reasonable way to do things if you can do it. Um, a very common kind of deployment might be much simpler on one of the sides. So what if Alice only has her phone, she doesn't have anything else, uh, no, no keys written down on a piece of paper, and she doesn't really have a cloud that's inside her circle. She's contracted maybe with a service uh, somewhere that provides access to a cloud for her. But instead of it being inside her circle where she trusts it, it's outside her circle where she doesn't trust it. So um, that also has to work with peer dids. Um, and then lastly, just to kind of make us all bite our fingernails and be a little bit nervous, here's a situation that also has to work with peer dids. It's really complicated. Imagine that Acme is, um, has a relationship with some kind of a bot swarm that uh, is, I don't know, delivering groceries for it or um, doing some other kind of service. And the, the swarm as a unit has an identity, um, but um, maybe individual uh, bots in the swarm have special roles and they serve as aggregators. And so you have things that are uh, kind of fronted by these aggregator bots. And these aggregator bots can talk to each other and they can talk to the cloud, but maybe Acme server that's contracting with uh, the bot swarm can also reach out and talk directly to um, some of the bots. The point is you could have a very complex uh, topology inside a sovereign domain on either side and it could be hierarchical or it could not be hierarchical and you could also have um, interesting complexities about crossing the boundary in ways that we don't understand. So the solution to peer dids has to address all of these possibilities in some way. It doesn't have to necessarily treat them all as equally desirable, but it has to think about all of these problems. And um, what I'd like to now, this might seem like I'm changing the subject, but I'm not actually. How you address all of these uh, connectivity issues is tied also to the question of how you authorize things. So now I'm going to introduce the concept of authorization briefly, and then um, I'll show you how these connect. So this is a section of a DID document, uh, a peer DID document, that has the same kind of structure as the sample I showed you earlier. So we're defining profiles and we're defining rules. But what I'm uh, highlighting here is the need to um, handle certain cases for security purposes. So a classic one is, my phone was stolen, how do I keep the thief from taking over my DID? How could you do that with peer dids? Well, um, let's say in the profiles section of authorization, you've, you've said, there's three different keys that I'm going to give profiles to. So there's a key that has this ID MV6, uh, and I said that's an edge key. There's a key that has H3C, I've said that's an offline key, and then there's a key NP4 that I've said has an edge uh, profile. And let's say in our particular situation that NP4, that key, is on the stolen phone. So what could we put in a DID document that would make it so that uh, a thief of a phone would not be able to abuse this uh, stolen phone? The answer is down in the rules section. There's a rule here that says grant key admin privileges when, and then there's this block that says any, and so basically any is like a, a Boolean or. It's, it's saying when any of these conditions is true, then um, you have the ability to add or remove keys from my did document okay so what are the two conditions well condition one is that you have two edge keys that are um, agreeing on the change condition two is that you have all with this is like a boolean and 
all of the following things conditions are met. You have one uh, edge key and one offline key. So the net effect of this is what's kind of shown out at the side. The rule says, um, I will let uh, somebody add or remove a key in my did document only if either two edge keys propose the change or an edge key and an offline key agree to the change. So now if you're a thief and you've stolen the phone and you have the ability to control one edge key, can you delete any uh, agents from Alice or any keys from Alice's did doc or add any keys to Alice's did doc? Yeah, because the rule says that that can't be done. Um, this is a simple example. Very complex examples can be modeled with the same uh, mechanism. And the point that I'm trying to make is that you can authorize whatever you need to authorize and set up whatever kinds of protections you feel are needed um, for a particular sovereign domain. And those sovereign domains can be, you know, complex things like this, simple things like this, um, or centralized things or decentralized and ad hoc things. Any of those things can uh, take advantage of the ability to express authorization rules. Now, um, let me talk about the privileges that go along with these authorization rules. What are those privileges? The privileges are listed in blue and a definition is given next to each one of them. Um, I wanna highlight a few things here. Traditionally, uh, in discussions in DID circles, we've primarily talked about um, a key as being able to uh, be used for DID authentication. Uh, we've talked about a key being able to encrypt. We've talked about a key being able to sign. And um, the DID, the peer DID spec is opinionated that we need to be more granular than that. And uh, there's some subtle reasons why. So, for example, there's three different admin categories here. The ability to add or remove keys from a DID document and assign them to profiles is the key admin privilege. But that's not necessarily the same as the ability to add or remove service endpoints. Um, and likewise, uh, the rule admin um, privilege is independent. What you can do because these are independent is you can create a balance of powers where you trust a particular key or set of keys to define service endpoints, but not to define the privileges of the keys that you might encounter when you talk to those endpoints. Or you can say, you can, you know, here's a, here's a set of keys that can create other keys and administer their roles, but they can't change the rules. The rules were defined once a long time ago, and it requires a different uh, kind of privilege to change the rules, saying that edge keys are no longer important, or offline keys don't matter, or something along those lines. And um, the other one that I think is interesting here to talk about, uh, the oblige privilege. Um, if I want to just use a metaphor for a sec for a second. Um, imagine that you have two countries, and you're trying to conduct official business as the ambassador of a country. Um, if you are, let's say you're a low-level ambassador, meaning you don't, you're not the chief ambassador. You're like one of the ambassador's uh, uh, lieutenants. Um, should your interactions, if you take a message to the uh, other government of the country that you're working with, if you take that message to them, should they think that your message is official? Sure. But do you have the privilege to sign a treaty on behalf of your country? Probably not. That's the difference. Uh, obliging somebody is about entering contractual obligations and um, just carrying messages is different. And to um, put this in kind of concrete terms, uh, for SSI, you could engage in some kind of an interaction with um, Alice where you ask her to pay you for something and you ask her to meet you and schedule an appointment and you could know that you're dealing with Alice. But if you say, Alice, I would like you now to sign a legal contract, 
uh, I want you to agree to terms of service, that kind of a thing. You probably want a key that Alice has said has the oblige privilege, not just a key that's a low level lieutenant for Alice. Um, and Daniel, just, just a question coming in here from Doug. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Yeah, um, he's asking what enforces the rules, uh, smart contracts or decentralized rules, uh, a decentralized rules engine, or is this just messaging and left up to parties to determine how to how to act? Um, thank you for asking that question. It's super important. Um, the answer is that Alice enforces the rules for Bob, and Bob enforces the rules for Alice, and that might seem like a really weird kind of tr silly answer, but it actually makes deep sense. Let me explain why. Um, I'm going to go back to my analogy of two countries and having ambassadors. Let's say that there's uh, A land and B topia. I'm going to have a slide later on that shows A land and B topia. Okay, so if A land has its ambassadors over in B topia and it's trying to conduct some kind of official business, who cares? whether um, the acts of a purported ambassador from a land are really official acts the answer is b btopia cares a lot right so btopia should be motivated to say wait a minute this ambassador is requesting an official uh you know modification to our treaty do we want to do something about it they should care whether the party that's proposing that thing is really an empowered ambassador for a land um, <clears throat> c land doesn't care d land doesn't care only b land does and that's a little bit funny because a land is the one that is asking for enforcement but b land is the one that really cares or btopia so um, in the same way alice expresses the rules that i've shown like in this thing in her did document this could be a, an excerpt from alice's did document the rules show up in uh, Bob's version of the did document for Alice, and Bob has stored that. And when Bob gets a communication from Alice, and the communication says something like, "Hey, um, I'll I'll sell you uh, you know my bike for a hundred dollars if you want," Bob says to himself, "Is this really Alice, or could it be an attacker um, trying to scam me out of a hundred bucks?" And Bob is motivated to check the authorization rules that Alice has expressed so that he can know with confidence whether or not um, he's, he's dealing with the right person. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, I'm gonna go on a little bit. Um, and if, if we need to come back to it, ask the question again. Yeah, um, I mean, Doug is just asking, like, um, so this is similar to presenting ver verifiable credentials? Yes. It is, except that the thing we're presenting is not uh, nearly as complex as a verifiable credential. Um, a verifiable credential requires that you go check signatures against a blockchain. Um, it requires reputation by the issuer. There's a trust framework associated with it. Um, there's expiration and revocation rules and all kinds of stuff. Here, what we're talking about is much simpler. It's, it's just Alice saying, this is what my keys can do. And you can record that in the did document that you have for me. And then whenever my keys try to do something, like send you a message or sign something or whatever, you can go check and see if my keys are supposed to be doing that. I think this will become a little bit clearer as I talk through some more examples. Um, so let me go on and re-raise the question if we need to go into more detail after you've heard a little bit more. Um, the register privilege is another one that's really important. It needs to be the case that a, um, a did cannot be registered wrongly. So let me give you a scenario that would be bad. Alice creates a, a pairwise did for Bob, and she and Bob start having um, you know, interactions using this did. And let's say that this, uh, this did that Alice has created 
comes to have quite a bit of reputation associated with it. Bob knows a lot about her. Um, they have a very productive ongoing uh, connection. And um, let's say that Alice also has rotated or updated the state a number of times, maybe 10 times. So now let's say that one of the devices in Alice's world gets hacked and she um, doesn't know it at first, but this device that gets hacked wants to co-opt some of the reputation that Alice has built up and wants to share Alice's did and create a new relationship unbeknownst to Alice with Carol. Um, what is to stop uh, this co-opted device in Alice's world from contacting Carol on its own and going through the did exchange protocol and saying to Carol, hey, here's the did I want to use with you, and lo and behold, it's the same did that's already been used with uh, Bob, and it has acquired reputation, and it's, it has an evolved state, but somehow the co-opted device dials back to version 4 and says, hey, I'll, I'll share version 4 with, um, with Carol. If the, if the co-opted device can do that, that would be bad. Um, another example of this, then this applies, by the way, not just to peer dids, but to every blockchain out there. What's to stop somebody, if they create a did locally and then they go to a blockchain to register it, if that's kind of the workflow that happens, what's to stop uh, bad software on the device that created the did from registering it before the good software can register it? Um, or from giving it a reputation or doing something with it that the real correct owner um, doesn't want to have happen. Now, this is a deep topic. Um, there are some experts that might be on this call um, that might have questions about this at the end. We can get into some of the details of this, but suffice it to say, the register privilege is what prevents um, a key, any key that belongs to Alice, from just going out and putting the did in some new relationship. And the way that that works, there's three rules for registration. The first rule is exactly one key must have the register privilege in the Genesis version of the peer did document. When you create the peer did document, you must say, this is the key that is the register key. And that's the one and only key that can be used in the um, did exchange protocol that establishes the connection between the, the peers. Um, the second thing to know is that signing a did document is not enough. The reason it's not enough is because signing a did document just endorses the content of the did doc, and what you really want to endorse is the did doc in the context of the relationship you're trying to create. So there's some details about how um, to do that uh, that we could get into if we want later, but um, basically, um, you have to go through the dance that's prescribed in the did exchange protocol correctly so that the, the state of the relationship is fully endorsed by the register key. If you try to short circuit that, it should not be trusted. The last thing is you can't register peer dids after their genesis state unless, and there's, there's a caveat to this, but this takes us down a very deep um, uh, side thing. If you're trying to upgrade to NYs, then you can re-register. So Alice and Bob can have a relationship, and when they get married and have a child, they could add the child to their pairwise relationship. But in order to do so, both of the other um, dids in the relationship would have to consent to promoting that to NYs. And like I said, that's a deep subtopic we can go into later. So now I want to talk about the other half of the gnarly pictures that um, I drew with arrows going different directions between ovals for Alice and Bob. I talked about authorization. Now I want to talk about data flow for a minute. How do you actually make the deltas that Alice is generating on her side flow to the right places given some picture like this or like this or like this or like this? And um, the answer is that peer dids use a strategy that was um, 
first studied in the decentralized identity space inside uh, diff circles uh, in relation to hubs. Um, they use what's called a conflict-free replicated data type, CRDT. And if you're interested in this data type, um, you can go read about, it's actually a family of data types. You can go read about this in Wikipedia articles and blog posts online. It's the technology that Google Docs uses right now when you have 10 or 20 or however many people all editing the same doc. How do you allow those edits to happen without ever coming up with merge conflicts? Um, and the answer is if you use this particular approach to data types in your, in your structure, then um, you can eliminate most conflicts and the ones that remain you can uh, automatically resolve so that people never have to deal with them. And the foundation of this is that we uh, we don't uh, support modification directly. Rather, everything is a combination of adds and deletes, and a given item can only ever be in one state in its lifetime. So that means, for example, you create a key in a DID document, and that key has a known uh, state, and you couldn't change its ID or its um, uh, its uses or something like that after it's been created. You have to specify exactly what you want. If you want something different, then you delete the old thing and add the new thing. That's not enough by itself uh, to accomplish CRDT goals, but it's the foundation of it is doing it that way. Um, I think you might have some questions about CRDTs. Hold those if you do, because there's some slides coming up that'll explain this in a little bit more detail. But now let me talk about how do you actually guarantee that Alice has a consistent view of the world? Uh, let's let's go back to one of my you know fearsome diagrams. Instead of Alice, we'll say Acme. You'll notice there's lots of arrows and lots of different things inside Acme's world. And how do you guarantee? that these three servers all agree on what the state of Alice's world is, or Acme's world, and don't um, end up with forked realities. Um, I've had that question posed to me many, many times, and the first year that I thought about peer dids, I felt like my answer wasn't very good, but some things have clarified in my mind, so I wanna kind of walk you through the analysis of that. It seems that there are really um, three possible answers to this question. The first possible answer is um, you can um, use consensus. Now there are various kinds of consensus algorithms, but um, the consensus algorithm that we want to use would have to answer some pretty hard questions. We would have to tolerate participants in the algorithm that have different duties, you know, like going back to um, this picture, there are servers, but there's also uh, these gears represent like cron jobs or processes, and they, they have very different kind of role in Acme's world than servers do. And there may be somebody inside, an employee that's using a phone um, inside Acme's world. Um, there's things on paper that can't be updated in the same way as others. So how do you have an algorithm where you're having consensus among things that are that different in their duties and in their connectivity? Um, and I'm realizing uh, that this slide is slightly outdated. There's a, a comment about centralization um, in the latest version of this slide, I apologize. Basically says centralization is a great idea. This gets back to this picture. We can centralize all of Alice's world and say everything has to go through uh, a cloud. And that's totally great. But what we can't do is Alice can't say, hey, Bob, I'll only talk to you if you centralize your world the same way. So Alice can't depend on the fact that Bob has centralized on his side. Bob may be centralized, but he may be more like this on his side. Um, so as an answer, centralization works great on one. It's a one sided answer, not a two sided answer, which leaves us with some gnarly questions. It basically says, okay, then if you can't do consensus easily and you can't centralize, aren't you stuck with forking? 
And the answer is yes, you are stuck with forking, but forking isn't really that bad. Now, that might seem like a crazy uh, assertion, but let me, oh, this was the slide I thought I had, so I, I guess I just duplicated the slide. Um, let me see if I can convince you that forking's not that bad. So what I've drawn here is A-Land and Btopia, two countries, and I've drawn um, cities in these countries, and the capital is the one with the big red dot and a smaller but important city um, uh, somewhere else, and I've drawn diplomatic staff for the two countries. So inside of A-Land, is diplomatic staff from this other country, Btopia, okay? And inside of Btopia is diplomatic staff for A-Land. And so at the capital, the national capital of Btopia, the head ambassador for A-Land, A.1, lives and works in the embassy. And in these two cities, a, uh, there are consulates that are managed by somebody who's like an under ambassador. Now the reason I'm uh, positing this scenario is because I'm, I'm going to show you a forked reality and have you think through what um, the consequences of it are. Um, so in this, for, in this scenario, let's say the president or the congress or some official of a land that has authority beyond dispute says, it's time to fire one of the people in our diplomatic corps. We don't like what A.3 is doing, so A.3 is fired. Okay, and how do they express that idea? So maybe they pick up the phone and they call the head ambassador in um, the capital of Betopia and they say, um, A.3 is fired and um, you need to tell A.3 right away and tell all the other staff everywhere in the country so everybody knows about it. Great. A.1 says, okay, I'm going to do that. She immediately picks up the phone and gets a hold of, um, I'm sorry, yeah, she immediately picks up the phone and gets a hold of um, one of her uh, two understaff in another city, but not the other one. And that's why there's an, a solid line and a dotted line. So now let's suppose that one of the staff, A2 is the one that she didn't get a hold of right away. A.2 is going through his mail, and um, he sees an, a communication from A.3, and the communication says, hey, we're supposed to arrange a national parade. Um, a, we're supposed to appear at a national parade uh, in your city. Can you, you know, arrange, uh, make all the arrangements for that to happen? A.2 acts on the assumption that A.3 is still authorized at the point in time when this happens. But in fact, A.3 has already been fired. A.2 just doesn't know it yet. Now, the question is, did, if A.2 starts to make arrangements with Btopia about this parade, um, is Btopia going to honor those arrangements? If the answer is yes, then essentially you have uh, a kind of a forked reality because A, dot, a land um, would say we repudiate all of the actions of A.3 uh, beginning at the point in time where we fired him. But um, if the country over here accepts those actions, then as much as A, dot, a land would like to repudiate them, the fact that the actions actually occurred and were accepted is it, it is just that it's a fact. You can't claim that. Um, it didn't happen. What you can do is undo them afterwards, but um, it is really a forked reality. And so the reason I'm telling you this story in the context of a country is this happens all the time in real life, and countries don't fall apart because of it. Why not? The answer is because everybody has reasonable expectations. The expectations are that there is latency in the system, and if you don't like the characteristics of latency, you, meaning a land, can do something about it, but it's not our, meaning Btopia's, problem. So if a land really wants to prevent forked reality, it can go to great lengths to guarantee that 
you know, A.3 and A.2 find out about stuff right away. It can make them carry satellite phones and it can insist that it, they check in on, within 30 seconds if they get a beep um, uh, on their pager or whatever it is they do. But it's not Btopia's problem. Btopia is going to take actions based on what it knows about reality at the time. And if those actions turn out to be unfortunate or undesirable from A's perspective, then A can later undo them or clean up the mess, but it can't deny that there was a forked reality. So this is the mental model I would like to suggest that we uh, apply to the problem of forking and the problem of you know, preventing uh, unauthorized uh, use of DIDs, peer DIDs. And the model is that keys and authorization rules enforce privileges. The synchronization protocol just makes data flow, and those are not the same thing. What I mean by that, making data flow, is um, if there's a synchronization protocol that A uses to inform its own internal people and possibly external people about changes that it makes, then the protocol's job is to report reality, even if it's forked. It's not the protocol's job is not to guarantee that reality converges. The job of guaranteeing that reality converges is enforced by the key and authorization rules. And by doing this, the synchronization gets much more tractable and um, the focus goes where it is appropriate to put them, which is on the keys and authorizations in the first place. An example of something that could be done in this um, scenario I described to prevent bad forking is a land could tell Btopia in advance, hey, if any of our staff ever go to schedule parades, we require the signature of two consuls or ambassadors in order to, to make that an official request from us. And if they establish that rule in advance with Btopia, then um, they don't have to worry about the fact that um, there's a partial, partially known reality here because they've already said when that partial reality occurs, we've prevented certain actions from happening. Hopefully you can see the, how the, the distinction lets us solve different parts of the problem in different ways. Okay, we're running late on time. I think I'm gonna skip over some of these. I'll just, um, uh, make really brief comments. Um, there's a notion of a change that is pending, not just a change that has actually happened. So if you, for example, say, um, I'm going to make change X, um, but it requires three uh, signatures to take effect. You, you propagate knowledge about the proposed change even before you have the three signatures, and the propagation allows parties who might um, want to sign to decide to sign and then they can propagate their signatures as well. There could be a point in time when a change is proposed but hasn't actually taken effect. That's called a pending change. Um, how you propagate knowledge about state when you're having other kinds of communication of any kind. You're issuing credentials, you're having a chat, you're negotiating a price, you're proving something to somebody, all of those kinds of messages, you can add a little decorator or you could think of it like a header on a message where you just say to the other party, kind of like the e-tag message on HTTP uh, communications, you say, by the way, this is the state that I know about. And when you say that, uh, the other party can say, oh, wait, you know about a state that I don't know about. I guess we better engage in the synchronization protocol to bring ourselves up to date. So this is just a triggering mechanism. Uh, I won't talk about that. Um, this is the more info slide. I think I'll stop here and take questions now. I'm sorry, uh, I'm realizing how uh, many questions I might have left unanswered, but I'll do my best to plug that gap. Yeah, awesome. Let's see if there are any questions that might come in now. Um, you mentioned before, like let, let, let me ask a couple of things, um, that some people have been implementing um, peer DIDs already. Um, what are those implementations that have been happening so far? They are, um, 
there is a reference implementation uh, that goes along with the spec. Um, that's done in Python. And you can look up, if you're using PyPy, you can install the uh, peer did package and you'll get it. Um, there is an implementation in the Ares Go framework. And um, there are pending implementations in Rust for Ares uh, and Indy. Okay. And w w what is it? Because I, I know that this is something that is dear to your heart um, in, in the sense that you want to see more of this happening. Um, what is it that, that, that you hope that um, developers and people around the world in the SSI community will be doing with this? And, and, um, and what do you expect? to happen with uh, this whole, let's call it new set of possibilities. Yeah, so here's my goals. Goal one, I want you to know that it's possible to do DIDs without blockchains or any other kind of global source of truth. And that there's, a, there's been a kind of carefully designed method for doing that. Goal, goal two, I want you not to be intimidated by it. It's not actually very hard going to the, uh, the slide that I showed about the, uh, shoot, I'm not sure where it is. This one that, that has a coding time to implement. You can do sp static peer dids in relatively short order. And if you have a library that implements the dynamic support, um, even better. Uh, so you shouldn't feel intimidated. And then goal three is I would love to have people show up and collaborate. The spec for peer dids is not set in stone right now. It's like I described earlier, relatively stable. It's not changing super fast, but it is still uh, changing a bit and good ideas would be very welcome. Great. And um, if, 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 let's imagine a world where this gets implemented widely and everyone takes it up as, as a reference. Um, how, how do you see like this would be distributed between like, let's call them like the standard bits that need a ledger or a reference point and 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 the DID, uh, peer DID, oh, here you have it, 99%? Yeah, I think 99% of DIDs don't belong on a ledger at all. Um, by the way, there are some other DID methods that are now being proposed that are also off ledger. So this is not the only one, but I think it's the richest uh, the richest one in terms of possibilities and um, the details in the spec and the implementations. But anyway, um, I don't think most DIDs belong on a ledger when they're only, why would you make it possible for the whole world to read something that only two people in the world care about? Yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. I, and, and this really would bring us closer to, to the, ledgerless and let's call it ledger agnostic because basically there would be no ledger it would be just it would be like peer-to-peer -peer ssi yeah well we definitely Mostly. still need ledgers we need them so that yeah. you can have a public reputation for a public did but yeah. you know when alice and bob meet each other they don't need a, a giant global database to record their relationship they just need each other to know that it exists and this would be applicable also. Let's imagine a world where we have a sovereign, a U-port, and a Veriswat, and whoever else um, with different ledgers um, um, applying the same method. All this should be interoperable then. Is that correct? That's right. There, there's nothing about peer dids that binds you to any particular ledger or credential ecosystem. It's very agnostic to that stuff. Um, it's basically just define some keys and define some rules about how you want to use them and tell the other party, um, which should work for anybody. Oh, that's amazing. Just to have a general sense and to allow everyone um, to, to, to know um, what the other methods that are being considered right now, what, what are those other methods that are being considered? I mean, like they're so similar to peer dits. There's two other methods that I know of that are pretty independent of other, um, that they're somewhat like this. One is called did key, and um, that was kind of some work that was sponsored by um, uh, Digital Bazaar, and I think they have a spec that describes how that one works. Did key is very much like static peer dids. It doesn't allow dynamic updates of any kind, and it also doesn't allow you to have more than one key, so it doesn't have an answer to the question, 
Uh, what do you do if you lose your phone? How do you protect somebody from taking it over? But in the narrow case where you're trying to interact um, just for, let's say, five minutes, and then you're throwing away the relationship, uh, did key solves that problem really, uh, really quite nicely. Peer dids also solve that problem nicely, but um, peer dids uh, are a little bit more complex because you have to exchange a did doc. With did key, all you do is exchange the did, and you know what the did doc must be because it's implied by the did itself. Um, so that's one, and then the other one is called did secp256, I think, and I think this came out of uh, some work done at Consensus. Uh, it's very similar. It's just a slightly different prefix, but the same kind of concept. And then there's a, another one that's interesting, but not a direct equivalent, and that's did git. This is um, using git repos as the source of truth instead of um, IPFS or something. It's more decentralized than uh, like IPFS, but it's less decentralized than simply telling the other party because um, you are checking in your state to a reference location that people can go get it from. So that's a little bit more centralized. Um, so I guess there's more of a continuum. Okay. I mean, just to clarify, I mean, just like, I mean, like two last questions. I mean, because I think like, there's no other questions from everyone else right now. Just I find this super fascinating. Um, like, do we, like, in the stack ledger or like the source of truth, um, as, as we've been thinking about it in the SSI world for a long time, has been like to have this decentralized way of managing keys and dits and, and stuff. So if 99% of dits um, will be off ledger, that means like, the ledger will be like a very, very small part of the whole reality of what SSI means because this that's the main function is to do that, right? Or is there something else that I'm missing that 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 goes on the ledger that is also relevant that that, I, that I'm not taking into consideration? Well, there's lots of things that you need a source of truth for. DIDS is only one of them. You need a source mm -hmm. of truth for, uh, for example, the revocation state of a credential. Mm -hmm. um, you need a source of truth for the schema of a credential. Um, you need the source of truth for um, the um, who intends to publish credentials with which um, keys. So I think there's uses for blockchain that are quite compelling, and I'm not expecting it to go away. But what I'm expecting is for it to um, become more specialized. Um, I don't think we all kind of went through an evolution when we first realized how uh, cool the trust properties of blockchains were. We all said, oh, we'll just dump everything on the uh, blockchain because now we get all this trust. What we're realizing with a ton of different efforts like Plasma on Ethereum and um, the Lightning Network on Bitcoin and so forth is it's possible to conduct a lot of business off the blockchain, but somehow link back to the blockchain. And it means we still want the blockchain in a big way, but we just don't want it for the bulk of the, the activity. We want it for just the high value things that anchor the trust. Outstanding. And maybe if you want to go back to the slide uh, where people can learn more and um, also catch up with you if they want to, to learn more about this. Um, any final thoughts you would like to share, Daniel, or um, not we wrap it up? Um, I, I'm sure that there are people who want to talk about deep security uh, implications and deep replication synchronization questions about CRDTs. Um, I'd love to have those conversations. Please reach out to me. Um, the thinking here is I wouldn't characterize it as being deeply mature and um, there's it's bulletproof, but I would characterize it as being um, pretty, at this point it's it's been baked a fair amount and um, it has been implemented. And um, I th I'm starting to feel fairly confident that the basic ideas are right. Um, so I'm hoping that this is a, a very productive area for the whole community to collaborate in in the future. And I'm hoping that it also has the political benefit because it's not tied to a particular blockchain, we don't have to approach peer dids with baggage in our minds about, oh, this is sponsored by this particular community or this ties me into that particular stack. It's very independent of that. Great. I just had a last minute 
question coming in here from Doug. He's asking, is anyone using OrbitDB for CRDTs? Um, I heard somebody was using OrbitDB, but I'm having a hard time remembering the context. It, it feels to me like it was some conversation in um, a diff circle. Um, if there's somebody on the call that is using them or knows what that conversation was, let me know. Otherwise, all I can say, Doug, is I've heard that somebody's using OrbitDB for something, but I can't remember the details. Okay, if not, I think maybe checking out the diff Slack channel might help too. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you so much, Dan Daniel. And um, for everyone else, if you want to follow up um, with all this and um, see the recording, I'll be trying to get it up as soon as possible. Um, we will have upcoming in December, we have Alexander Sherbakov, um, who's a software engineer with BSR and also works with Evanim. He will be talking about Hyperledger Indy and Hyperledger Plenum to learn more about Hyperledger Noteworks in general. So um, changing completely on subject, but um, very relevant too. And um, if you want to learn about this and follow up, um, please just join the newsletter, which you have on the website. On, on the bottom, you have the Telegram channel, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and all those things where we update all this. And Daniel, thank you so much for, for your time. I think there will be so much more coming out of this from the um, peer DID space. And uh, really look forward to learn from you how that evolves and hope to share it again with the SI Meetup community so that we can all learn about it and keep it growing. Great. Thank you. Thank you.